Hey everyone, welcome to another deck tech. Today we're going to be deck teching Teamer Rogues. Before I start, I just wanted to say hello to all my new subscribers. I know a lot of you came here for the giveaways that I'm doing this year and many, many more next year. But I hope you enjoy most of the content that I put out. I try and put as much as possible, you know, hopefully to interest at least some of you with some of the content. And what I do a lot of is brewing. So you're going to see in this deck tech uh, deck I'm presenting to you. In fact, it's a deck I've presented before a couple of months ago. I'm revisiting it again and I'm going to be playing it in Teamer colors and in Saltai colors. So stay tuned for the Saltai version, which will be released later today. Yeah, let's uh, let's get right into it. Let's start off with the core. So Team of Rogues, for anyone who had looked at the deck tech that I had posted a while ago, is a fun modern deck that I played many, many years ago. It was a deck that I unfortunately didn't come up with my own, as, as smart and as a genius as I am. Uh, no, not really, but it is not a deck that was my original doing. It was something that I saw Jordan Boisvert on Modern Nexus post up at least in some form and the minute I saw the idea I loved it and I just kind of took it my own way from there and I played it quite a bit you know many many years ago and I played it many quite a bit this year and I have always had a ton of fun and the core is really what you're looking at here so you know let's start off with Fairy Miscreant I've had a lot of people question me on Fairy Miscreant but believe it or not I have won plenty of games with a 2-2 two, two, or a 3-3 three, three Fairy Miscreant just popping in for damage every turn. Your opponents will often try and ignore Fairy Miscreant because they think it's just a 1-1 one, one flyer and they just kind of want to target your Tarmogoy for or some other payoff creature or spell. But Fairy Miscreant actually does a lot of work for you, especially in conjunction with Obsessive Skinner. So Obsessive Skinner puts a 1-1 one, one counter on your creature when it enters the battlefield, and if you have Delirium, which you often do in this deck, you get to put a plus one plus one counter. At the beginning of every one of your opponent's uh, turns, so uh, at, at their upkeep essentially, I'm reading the card right now just to be sure, uh, but at the beginning of each of their upkeeps, uh, you put a plus one plus one counter, so eventually you start boost, essentially you boost your team, and a lot of often times you're targeting either your Luteril Core, which you see on the screen as well, or your Fairy Miscreant, so don't, you know, don't scoff at fairy miscreant yes the draw card ability is cool when you can draw multiples and you know cast them at the same time but it's not really why it's in the deck it's only partially why i mean the the main theme of this deck is drawing cards so draw as many cards as you can get into your threats and beat down your opponent that's that's essentially the aim of the game and that's why we also have another another awesome card thieves fortune i love thieves fortune honestly if, it, if this card didn't exist this deck in this form would not exist thieves fortune is an amazing card okay you are almost always casting it for one blue mana and what you get to do essentially i mean the wording is right there you look at the top four cards of your library you put any one you don't have to reveal it you put any one into your hand and the other three at the bottom of your library in any order that is so powerful i have won so many games because i needed to just dig i need to dig for an answer i need to dig for a lightning bolt or i need to dig for a tarmogoy for something and it was there and thieves fortune just does so much work sometimes you get a thieves fortune the top the top four cards are meh but one of the four is another thieves fortune so you take the thieves fortune and you cast that one right away for another one blue mana and you look at the next four so you've cycled through eight cards and usually, you know, unless you're extremely unlucky, you will find an answer in those eight cards. And it happens to me all the time. So Thieves Fortune is an amazing card. It's, it's the reason you'd want to play this deck is because you want to be able to cast Thieves Fortune. And of course, Looter Ill Core, just going back a bit here. It's a great creature for 2 CMC. It's a 1-1 one, one with Shadow. So essentially, it can't block or be blocked by any other creature unless they have Shadow. And essentially, no other, modern, uh, no other creature in Modern has Shadow, so it's just going to be alone. On a battlefield, it's always going to be pinging in for one, unless you have Obsessive Skinner, so it's going to be boosted, and it's going to be pinging in for way more than one, and your opponents are going to feel really crappy about having to spend mana to kill it. Um, and oftentimes they don't, they just let you go ahead and loot, and that is exactly what you're doing. So when you deal damage to a player, a combat damage to a player with Luteal Core, you draw a card and you discard a card. That is a powerful, powerful ability. Don't, again, don't scoff at it. The whole, the whole theme of this deck is drawing cards so being able to draw for cards find your answers it's a beautiful thing and team of rogues allows you to do it 
So let's move on to the creatures. All right, so apart from the creatures you already saw in the core, we also have Noble Hierarch. So we don't run many lands in this deck, we run around 17. Noble Hierarch helps you, you know, ramp into your 2CMC, 3MC, 3CMC, and so on spells. And it's a great turn one play. But its exalted ability is also very relevant. Again, with Fairy Miscreant or Muriel Core, they're, they're small little creatures, they're 1 1s, but with an exalted trigger, all of a sudden there are 2 2s pinging in every turn. And if your opponent is not dealing with them or not dealing with Noble Hierarch, they're going to be in trouble, in serious, serious trouble. So Noble Hierarch actually is playing two major roles in Team of Rogues. And yeah, it's again, it's. An amazing card. It's not a rogue in and of itself. It would be amazing if it was, but it doesn't need to be a rogue in this case. It just needs to do what it's doing, which is giving you green or blue mana, and then giving your creatures exalted. Uh, it's it's. I can't say more about Noble Horror. Tarmogoyf. Well, it's Tarmogoyf. Who says Tarmogoyf isn't relevant in modern? I don't. I try and stick it into every deck I play. If there's green, I mean, just look at the decks I've. I've showcased on this channel already. Tarmogoyf is an awesome card. It's its most affordable point ever right now in modern, in any format, and it still does a lot of work. And this deck is also built around Delirium and growing the, the card types in your graveyard. Tarmogoyf is often a 5-6 or 6-7, very, very often. And yeah, it's just a huge creature that your opponents have to deal with, and they don't always have the answer. 6-7 uh, Tarmogoyf is, you know, that's a scary thing to be staring down. And yeah, and it also deals with opposing Tarmogoyfs, because, you know, it's essentially a stalemate, or it'll beat opposing Tarmogoyfs, thanks to Obsessive Skinner. So let's not forget about that. I'm also playing one main deck, or main board, Magus of the Moon. You can Traverse for Magus at any given time when you have Delirium in your graveyard and you have a Traverse the Elven Wald in your hand. We'll be getting to that card in a second. So, yeah, a Magus of the Moon. Your deck, this deck is built to, you know, be Blood Moon proof, essentially. So just don't be a dummy about fetching for your lands and you're usually good to go with a Magus of the Moon on turn three. If for whatever reason you see that, you know, you really need a Blood Moon-like effect and you, you don't have Magus of the Moon in your hand, if you have Traverse the Elven Wall, you essentially have a way to get Max of the Moon right away. So, yeah, that's it's a great card. You definitely want one in your main board. I run another one on the side alongside a Blood Moon. Yeah, it's an, it's another sub-theme of this deck. You do have the ability to attack your opponent's greedy mana base. And this is, of course, a flavor that I enjoy putting into a deck when I can. Huntmaster of the Fells. This card, if I could play eight of them... Uh, I would. If, if I could cheat this card into my deck, uh, you know, as many copies as possible, I would. Huntmaster of the Fells is an amazing card. It was way stronger in older uh, modern eras, I have to admit, but even today, a Huntmaster of the Fells, unanswered for even a turn or two, is going to be a huge problem for your opponent. You are getting two life, you're getting a 2-2 two -two, uh, wolf token, so you're getting a 2-2 two -two body just by casting it, and if for whatever, whatever reason your opponent can't cast a spell on their turn, he's flipping. He's flipping, he's becoming a 4-4, four, four, uh, he's becoming a 4-4 four, four trampler, and when he, when he flips, he also deals 2 damage to your opponent, and up to 1 creature that they control. So 2 damage to your opponent, 2 damage to a creature they control, that's when he flips, and you have the ability to control those flips yourself. So, again, Huntmaster of the Fells, just a beautiful card. I jam him in here, I could Traverse Swarm when I need him, and yeah, it's just, a, just an awesome card, and, and that does it for your creatures. Let's move on to Permission. I don't have much here, I run two Mana Leak. I think it's just enough for this deck. You're not really playing a huge control game, but having two Mana Leaks uh, in your deck can be useful, and you do have more permission uh, as a backup in your sideboard as well, but Manalik is setting the basis for your permission package, and I, and I think two work pretty well here. And your opponents often don't expect it when they see the type of cards you're playing, so it's also a nice little surprise. Let's go to removal. We have some pretty good removal here. Lightning Bolt, well, it's Lightning Bolt. I think whether you're a beginner or not, you know what Lightning Bolt does. It's super powerful. There's a reason why they don't want to bring it back into standard, because for one red mana, you're dealing three damage to any target, and that's just brutal. You play four of, you always play four of, you never side any out. Uh, well, unless you're in certain situations, of course. Then we also play two Seal of Fire. The main reason we're playing Seal of Fire here is because it's an enchantment, and, you know, uh, that goes that grows Tarmogoyf, and that also feeds Delirium. So, very, very important card, at least in my opinion. With Seal of Fire, 
uh, alongside the tribal subtype of Thief's Fortune, you cover every card type except Planeswalker and Artifact in this deck. And that's pretty good for some pretty big Tarmogoyfs and some really early Delirium plays. The Cantrips, well, we've got two. Oh, I, I just said that we don't have Artifacts, but we actually do. So I kind of lied to you. We have Serum Vision, so we're playing a four of there. And we are playing four Mishra's Bobble. Again, not much I can say about Serum Visions here. It is what it is. It's one of the best cantrips in modern, and it allows you to, you know, sculpt your hand, dig for an answer, whatever it may be. Many, many hands, one land uh, hands can be kept if there's a Serum Visions, because you could always quickly dig for a second land. And Mishra's Bobble, it's a cantrip, allows you to see your opponent's next draw or yours if you want to do some tricky fetches. And, of course, it feeds Delirium and it feeds your Tarmogoyf, so why not? The Tutors, so in this case, the Tutor, Traverse the Elvenwald, another core part of this deck, at least in my opinion, although you could play without Traverse the Elvenwald. You would lose something if you didn't have it, though. So, early on, it allows you to keep weird hands with weird mana, because, worst case, you could always cast Traverse the Elvenwald on turn one, get another land uh, for a color that you're missing, and then you go on from turn two. It's not the best turn one play, but it does reduce the amount of times you need to mulligan, and that's pretty important. But what you really want to do is using is casting Traverse for its Delirium ability. If you do have Delirium in your, gra uh, in your graveyard, so you have four, car uh, four or more card types, you get to search for any land or any creature. You're almost always going to be searching for a creature, and you're most likely always going to be searching for a Tarmogoyf, although sometimes Obsessive Skinner is a good target. Of course, if you need to Blood Moon your opponent, you could go and search up a Magus of the Moon. It essentially, essentially allows you to play a bit of a toolbox strategy, and this deck originally, in its original form, did have a more of a toolbox feel, especially the sideboard. I've since kind of, you know, backtracked that toolbox uh, theme a bit, because I think it was a bit too cute, but you still have some of that toolbox style with Traverse the Alvinwald in this deck. And believe it or not, I have a companion. Surprise! Now, the main reason I have uh, Gigantha as a companion in this deck is because I didn't have to do anything for it to work in this deck. So I didn't have any restrictions. There are no cards in the sideboard or in the main that I opted out of using because Gigantha is in here. But, you know, since I do meet Gigantha's uh, companion ability, I see no reason why not to run it. It's an extra threat. It's a 5-5. Five -five. In any game where your opponent just had all the removal spells, just kind of cleared your board, wiped your board, Gigantha is actually a great late game threat. You can get it at any point. Your opponent can't stop you. The only thing they can do is counter uh, Gigantha if you try and cast it. But if they can't counter it, it's coming down there, and now it's a 5-5, five, 5-CMC five, five creature, and not many removal spells can deal with Gigantha in modern. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm running I'm running Gigantha. I'm running 14 cards on the sideboard plus Gigantha, and I think it actually works pretty well. Last but not least, the boring part, the lands. Yes, this mana base is Blood Moon proof, as most of my teamer decks are. You're running one Breeding Pool, one Stomping Ground, two Steam Vents, and, of course, you got your basics there, two forests, two islands, one mountain, and, of course, your uh, your fetches. So, four Misty Rainforests, two Scalding Tarn, two Wooded Foothills. Straightforward. The reason why I have uh, a mountain there is because sometimes you need to be more creative with your fetches if you're playing a, an aggro deck or a burn deck, and, you know, fetching for a mountain allows you to avoid a shock, essentially, and losing uh, unnecessary life. It's the main reason why that mountain is there, uh, you know, to for those types of matchups. Last but not least, the sideboard. Yes, I'm going back to deck teching with sideboards. I used to do that, then I stopped. I'm going back. I think I should just stick to going through the sideboards really quickly. Again, I mentioned here that I have one Magus of the Moon and one Blood Moon in the sideboard. I think, you know, against decks like Tron or any other deck that has a greedy mana base, so four color decks or even five color decks, Blood Moon is your best friend. It also deals with Primeval Titan and Amulet Titan decks, so yeah, Max of the Moon, Blood Moon, very, very important. If you're playing Teamer, there's no reason why you shouldn't be playing these cards in your deck, uh, somewhere in the 75. Ceremonious Rejection is really there for big mana decks such as Tron. Uh, of course, you could also bring it in against, you know, any kind of artifact-based deck to have essentially a 1CMC counterspell. Uh, that's that. I think that's there. I mean, Tron is going to be an everlasting presence in Modern, so to having two Ceremonious Rejection is actually pretty important. 
I also have one disdainful stroke again to deal with a big mana decks or you know to deal with your control decks as well if or, or any deck essentially that has a healthy amount of four plus CMC cards that's why disdainful stroke is there. Veil of Summer well yeah why not it's still legal <laughs> and if again if you're dealing with a control deck or you're dealing with Jund or some other black deck with a lot of removal. Veil of Summer really pulls its weight. It's also pretty good against Mill and unfortunately that's a thing. So yeah, Veil of Summer 3 of is pretty good here. I think I think it works pretty well. Two a braid. Now I really like a braid here because you can deal with artifacts if you need to, but you could also bring it in for extra creature removal. And yeah, it's a versatile card and I think a braid's pretty important. Grafdigger's Cage deal with not magic essentially, and Euro decks as well. Uh, you could always up that number depending on your meta. I think two right now is okay, but if you re are really having issue issues with graveyard strategies in your meta, then you should definitely up that number, or maybe go to three Grafdigger's Cage. And if it's not enough, you could even add a Surgical Extraction and maybe get rid of Engineered Explosives. Speaking of which, Engineered Explosives, again, it's a card that I love to hate, or I hate to love, I guess. Um, it's a sweeper. I don't want to play Pyroclasm necessarily because Pyroclasm might, you know, would hit a lot of my creatures, whereas Engineer Explosives might only hit a few of my creatures if I have to deal with either Chalice of the Void. Well, Chalice of the Void not necessarily an issue, but any other uh, permanent on the other side of the battlefield that I can't deal with with any other card in my in my 75. So Engineer Explosives is more of the last resort removal for anything that's three CMC or less. Again, depending on your meta, you may opt to remove this from your uh, sideboard and play something else. That's perfectly fine, but I enjoy playing that uh, in my sideboard. And that's essentially it for Team of Rogues. So I'm going to be posting up a match today. It's going to be the last, uh, one of the two uh, last X-Mage matches that I'll be posting ever on this channel. Moving forward, uh, it'll only be MTGO, so just stick around for that. And in a couple of hours, I'll be posting up the Sultai Rogues. Uh, deck tech as well. We'll be going through the Sultai version of this deck and, and the changes and different types of gameplay. So stay tuned for that. I'm really excited for that because it's going to be the first time I'm playing Sultai Rogues. And yeah, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you enjoy my content in general, please subscribe, hit the notification bell. Thank you to all of my patrons. I really appreciate your support. If you want to become a patron as well, there's a link in the description. Yeah, thanks and have a good one.